Live on 20 News, where the news is shady, but the newscasters are shadier. With Audience Quintella. And Ty Besh. Coming to you live from our studio in downtown Tucson. First, the local headlines. Okay, uh, Pima County has scheduled five community meetings to discuss the proposed Monsanto greenhouse facility. The Pima County Board of Supervisors requested that the meetings occur so the public can get information and provide feedback concerning the project. Monsanto has already purchased a 155-acre unused lot in Marana, where the company plans to invest nearly $100 million into a greenhouse that would grow corn seeds. The facility plans were stopped in November when the board decided that the issue needed more study. The decision came after residents raised concerns with the company moving into Marana. Monsanto is a controversial agricultural and biochemical company who specializes in genetically modified organisms, GMOs. The company has come under fire from activists and small farmers who say that Monsanto's products are dangerous and helping to drive small farms out of business. The planned facility would be located in what's known as a foreign trade zone, so it would qualify for lots of tax breaks. Um, if the agreement does go through, Monsanto will receive a lower tax rate of 15%, and the land will only be taxed at a 5%. Monsanto will have the report that type and quantity of pesticides used at the site, along with water usage, water waste, uh, volumes, and any spill on the site. These reports will be handed over to an intern and immediately lost. The meetings will take place on, get, get out your pad and paper, January 9th at 5 p.m. at Oro Valley Public Library, January 13th at 11 a.m. at Green Valley Recreational Center, January 17th at 5 p.m. at L Town Community Center, or the ETCC, January 18th at 6 p.m. at Pima County Housing Center, PCHC, and January 19th at 6 p.m. at the Quincy Douglas Center, QDC as we all know. On Tuesday, the Arizona Corporation Commission swore in three new members and a new chairman. Tom Ferresi was tapped as the new chairman of the committee, which regulates utilities in Arizona. He proposed a 10-year audit of the committee, the establishment of the Code of Ethics, and an increase in public access to some records regarding the exploration of new energy technology. The committee has come under fire recently for politicizing its decision, especially in regards to solar technology. Regulators are accused of being too friendly to business interests in the state. Ferresi dismissed these claims as merely political fighting, but Arizona Public Service was shown to have invested $3 million to get the four new committee members elected to their posts. A day after the new members were inducted, they chose to sharply reduce incentives for homeowners to install solar panels. Not too surprisingly, that was high on Arizona Public Service's wish list for the new year. Previously, AAPS was required to buy excess power generated by rooftop solar installations and apply this to the customer's bill. Now they won't have to, so it looks like APS made a solid investment when they contributed that $3 million. The committee also agreed to raise rates for solar customers. The Alliance for Solar Choice said that they were deeply disappointed by the decision. But APS argued that so-called net metering for solar customers reduced their bills to nearly nothing. APS claims that solar customers weren't paying their fair share for electricity, meaning, of course meaning that APS it was depriving APS of the lion's share of the money they so badly want. The committee's ruling will see a sharp decrease in net metering, but by law, those decreases cannot exceed 10%. The committee will also vote in March on a request by Arizona Public Service to increase energy rates by 8%, and I think you probably see where this is going. Mm. An increase, that's where it's going. <laughs> yeah. Border officials has closed <laughs> off the border of Nogales because of protests at a railroad crossing in the city. Protests erupted across Mexico yesterday, and shockingly, they had nothing to do with Donald Trump. Mexicans are protesting a 20% hike in gasoline prices enacted this week. The price hike was unfortunately announced on the same day that long lines formed outside Pemex stations. The oil company wasn't able to supply their gas stations because of refining problems. Citizens in Mexico City set up blockades on major highways, demanding that the government reverse the move. But the government of Enrique Pena Nieto says that they needed to raise the price in order to shore up budget deficits. Rafael Pacciano, uh, Mexico's environment secretary, said that the artificially lowered price encourages Mexicans to use more oil and mainly, mainly benefits rich SUV owners. He said that higher prices would encourage more green methods of travel. The cheap gas has correlated with the rise in vehicle ownership across Mexico. More cars has meant an increase in traffic and stifling air pollution, particularly in dense areas like Mexico City. But the average Mexican isn't buying into Pachiano's play. 
They claim that their low salaries won't support the price rises. Republicans are singling out Arizona in the argument to repeal Obamacare. Our state is projected to experience an increase of up to 74.5% on health insurance in Arizona's affordable care marketplace. Blue Cross Blue Shield will raise rates by 51% and stop serving in Maricopa County, so that leaves only one company, Centene Corp., to offer insurance in the county. Centene plans will also increase by 74%. Centene calls their plan, named Am Better, the name that somehow lies to us and mocks us at the same time. Anyway, 7 in 10 Arizona residents do qualify for subsidies to help pay for their health insurance, but those subsidies will disappear if the Affordable Care Act is reversed. Senator Ann Mike Enzi has introduced legislation on Tuesday which aims to repeal the Affordable Care Act, better known as Obamacare. Enzi proposed the law without the existence of a replacement, which would leave 20 million people without health insurance. To make it easier to pass the bill, the senator wants to use a Senate maneuver called reconciliation. The bill would then only need a majority vote to pass, and it would be shielded from a filibuster. Reconciliation belongs to a group of Senate maneuvers, including filibusters, cold shoulders, log jammings, and the rarely used Dixieland scream-offs. It has to do with religion, doesn't it? Arizona has been granted federal aid to tackle the opiate epidemic, which has spread across the entire country. Our state was 15th overall in overdose in 2016. Now, 15 countries will split $3.6 million to fight abuse of opiates. The countries in, or counties include Pima, uh, Gila, Maricopa, and Yavapai. Or is it Gila? Uh, the federal funds were used to purchase and distribute community action toolkits. The toolkits include treat treatments, uh, strategies for law enforcement, uh, patient education, and prescribing, prescribing practices. And the health department plans to collect statistics on overdoses to develop a long-term strategy for dealing with the issue. Good stuff. Mm. It's that exciting time of the year again. Yes, we're talking about the 12th annual Grease Recycling Event in Tucson. The grease will be recycled by the Pima County Regional Wastewater Reclamation Department, who are probably the ones really deserving a raise. If you've been saving that grease, now's your chance to get rid of it to avoid further spiraling into full-on hoarder mode. If nothing else, it'll be the only time all year that you'll get the chance to be disgusted at your past year's diet in real time. The event takes place on Saturday, January 7th from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. in various sites around the city. You can release that grease at Easy O'Reilly Chevrolet at 6160 East, East Broadway Boulevard, the Midtown City Council Ward 3 office at 1510 East Grant Road, Northwest Pima Vocational High School at 5025 West Ina Road, South Kena Sports Complex at 2500 East Ajo Way, and Sarita Town Hall Complex at 375 West Sarita Center Way. I remember all of this. <laughs> uh, and now in national and international news. Great. Uh, President-elect Donald Trump is putting his faith in WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange as he continues to disparage American media. Always using the best of judgment, Trump quoted Assange on Twitter claiming that Russia was not the source of the DNC leaks that tore Democrats apart in November's election. Trump's support in Assange is strange in that Trump called for Assange to be killed back in 2010 following the arrival of WikiLeaks. But we know that Trump is a bastion of compassion and forgiveness, so it's only natural that he would come around on Assange. This uh, clearly has nothing to do with Trump trying to cover his ass. Trump's sudden Assange love fest urged fellow Cretan Sarah Palin to forgive Assange for hacking her emails back when she mattered. At least it got her back in the news for one day. But some Republicans are objecting to Trump's support for Assange, most notably House Speaker Paul Ryan, who called Assange a syncophant, syncophant of Russia on a conservative radio show. Regardless, Trump is looking to appoint Assange as the head of a newly created committee called the Department of Tremendousness. The department will be tasked with turning every Trump blunder into a conspiracy hatched by the DNC, Hillary Clinton, Rosie O'Donnell or Alec Baldwin. The Apprentice Presidential Edition is closing in on its finale, with Trump appointing Jay Clayton as SEC chair. Clayton is a former Wall Street lawyer specializing in corporate mergers and assures that the wolves are now watching the wolves. Among other clients, Clayton once defended Goldman Sachs, who Trump criticized on the campaign trail. The SEC is in charge of policing Wall Street and enforcing regulations regarding the financial industry, which Trump has promised to reverse once he becomes president. The swamp has now gotten so murky and thick that Trump Tower residents are complaining of a sour odor emanating from the floor. 
Carly Kahn, the activist investor who has taken on the role of business Gestapo for Trump, vetted Clayton. It looks as though Clayton's friendliness towards Wall Street could uh, again unleash an untamed financial industry that existed before Dodd-Frank went into effect. What could go wrong? In similar news, Trump appointed former art thief and Joey No Socks Cinque as na national arts ambassador. Here's a photo of Trump and No Socks in what appears to be hell, where the two vacation together in the winters. Uh, in a stunning, selfless act of heroism, our next Secretary of State cut his ties to the oil industry, taking home a measly $180 million for his troubles. Rex Tillerson has quit his CEO post at ExxonMobil a few weeks ahead of his confirmation hearings to avoid any conflicts of interest, of course. Tillerson was expected to retire in March when he would have received an additional $7 million in retirement cash and benefits. His sacrifice clearly knows no bounds. In a similar move, incoming director of his, uh, or of the National uh, Economic Council, Gary Cohn, I believe, sold $210 million in Goldman Sachs stock to clear himself of conflicts of interest as well. Cohn served as COO and president of Goldman Sachs. Responding to the move, Trump called Tillerson's decision weak and doubled down on his own conflicts of interest by taking over as CEO of ExxonMobil. Republicans in the Senate introduced legislation that moved the U.S. Embassy in Israel to the city of Jerusalem. S Senators Ted Cruz, Dean Heller, and Marco Rubio co-sponsored the legislation in the first week of Congress, much to the disappointment of a violently hungover Rand Paul. Similar laws aiming to recognize Jerusalem have been tried unsuccessfully over the past 20 years, but the difference this time is that they have the support from the incoming President Trump. The controversial decision to move the embassy could inflame tensions between Israel and Palestine, say a number of international legal experts and some former U.S. officials. Critics have accused Trump of being under the sway of the Israeli lobby and of having conflicts of interest with the country. Trump's son-in-law, Jared Kushner, gave money to hardline settlements in the West Bank through Kushner's family charity. Trump's pick for ambassador to Israel, David Friedman, also raised money for another hardline settlement in the West Bank. Trump has been unwavering his support for Israel and especially moving the capital to the religiously conflicted Jerusalem. The embassy now sits in Tel Aviv, the officially recognized capital of Israel. This is a less controversial spot than Jerusalem, a city being fought over since Jesus fought Muhammad in a cage matched to the death. In other news, Jesus wept. This ignited a Twitter response from Donald Trump, who call, called our Lord and Savior a, quote, disaster and very much a not good Palestinian guy. Emboldened by the victory, Senate Republicans will now attempt to move the U.S. Capitol to Trump Tower. According to the doorman, Ted Cruz called dibs on the 42nd floor penthouse, the one with the bidet. Does that mean Muhammad Ali won the fight? Because he... Probably not. Well, maybe the Trump inauguration won't be so dull after all. A marijuana legalization group plans to hand out 4,200 free joints at the event for anyone interested. Adam Eidinger heads up DCMJ, the group who helped to pass Washington's Prop 71, which legalized marijuana at the district. According to the law, citizens can carry up to two ounces of marijuana legally, although it cannot be legally bought and sold in Washington. Eidinger was prompted by the fear that Jeff Sessions, appointed attorney general by Trump, will try and claw back the law. He wants protesters to light up their joints at 420 in Washington's DuPont Circle, where the joints will be passed out. He warned that it's illegal to smoke on the National Mall, so do so at your own discretion. We'll see if the marijuana smoke masks the smell of sulfur emitted when Trump takes the stage on Inauguration Day. With any luck, Trump will catch a whiff and decide to quit the presidency and follow the string cheese incident on tour selling grilled cheese sandwiches. It's reality I hope to happen. New York's crime rate has fallen to its lowest level ever recorded. According to an NYPD report, the city saw a 12% decline in shootings for the year with a total of 998. This is the first time the number has fallen below 1,000 since they began tracking shooting statistics. New York's murder rate also fell from 352 killings in uh, 2015 to 336 in 2016, tied for second lowest ever and the lowest number of murders since 2013. The New York Times also reported that gang-related killings were sharply reduced, contributing to the overall 4% decrease in crime last year. While New Yorkers are safely walking the streets, the same can't be said of Chicago, who saw large increases in murders last year. The city experienced its most bloody in 20 years, with 762 murders last year and more than 4,300 shootings, a rise of 60% in the murder rate from 2015. There were more people killed in Chicago last year than New York and Los Angeles combined. Experts say that Chicago's violence is driven by small, fragmented street gangs that are battling for territory, 
particularly in the city's south side. Mayor Rahm Emanuel has promised 1,000 new officers to patrol the streets in 2017, and new community projects will be launched to try to stem the rise in violence. Chicago has gotten lots of attention this year, mainly because of comments by Donald Trump, who called out the city as being an example of rising crime across the country. However, it appears that Chicago is an outlier in a relatively low crime year in the U.S. Trump also claimed that New York had a rising crime rate, which was proven wrong by the recent report. In response, Trump will reportedly try to increase New York's crime rate to try to prove that he was correct. Mm. And Chicago was Obama's fault. Um, yeah. Guess what, people? It looks like you have a new organ, and no, you can't play with it. The organ is actually something that we've always had, but just didn't have a name for. A researcher at the University of Limerick looked to change that by brandishing the organ. The mesentery, which sounds like a disease you would contact, or contract in uh, Haiti. The organ connects the small intestine to the transverse colon and sigmoid colon, which helps to produce your morning mesentery. The intestine is kept in place by the mesentery, which allows the intestine to expand and contract. If there were no mesentery, then the intestine would have to sit along your body wall and wouldn't be able to make these movements, hmm. making digestion much more difficult. Leonardo da Vinci originally cited this organ, and it was known until 1885, when Sir Frederick Treves claimed that it was merely part of the small intestine. But now mesentery is back, so take that, Sir Frederick, Dr. J. Calvin Coffey, the researcher who named the mesentery, is lobbying for it to be included in the latest edition of Grey's Anatomy, which is still on, which is the authority text on our biology. However, scientists need to study the organ further to determine the exact location and the role in the intestine, vascular, endocrine, cardiovascular, and immunological systems. Here's hoping that the mesentery gets the respect it deserves, at least so we have something to talk about at that next house party. This was Lani Quintella. And Ty Besh. For 5 on 20 News. See ya. Red dudes uh, behind the Cushing Street skate park. Sick. Good luck.
machine. Cool. Hey guys, I'm Anias Contella for 5 on 20 News, and I'm here today with two local skaters, Caleb Gutierrez and, Gutierrez and Kyle Arashi, um, who are behind the Cushing Street Skate Park project. Um, do you guys want to tell me a little bit about yourself? Uh, yeah, I'm Kyle Arishi. I'm from uh, Portland, Oregon. Cool. And uh, I moved here about four years ago and just been uh, skating Santa Rita and stuff. Cool. I'm Caleb. I'm 26 from Oracle, Arizona. I've uh, been skating for all my life pretty much and live downtown Tucson. How would, would you say that you both got into skating in the first place? What led you there? Uh, just like high school days. Yeah. Yeah. Like we just had gotten a skate park and everything, so we just all started skating. Cool. Uh, just friends, like older friends, you know, just wanting to learn and them handing down a board, just saying, like, here you go. Yeah. So just, you know, influence. What would you say it's like to be a skater in Tucson maybe versus other places? Um, like, what do you mean by that necessarily? Um, <laughs> like, is the culture any different here than any other city? Is it harder, mm. easier to find places to skate? Yeah, it's definitely harder, especially in Tucson, because, mm -hmm. you know, it's not that big down here. So just, like, going to, like, different locations, you know, it's a drive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you agree with that? Yeah, it's yeah. Uh, spread out. Tucson's hard to skate. I yeah. Think. If you're young, you know, you need a car or find yeah. someone with a car. So yeah. did that influence the idea behind the skate park project? Uh, yeah. I mean, the whole, you know, the summer being out, you have to wait till sun sundown to go do anything, really. If you want to go to the store, go play basketball, go for a run. Mm -hmm. So a little bit, yeah, just being it so hot here in Tucson or in Arizona. Yeah, because the idea behind the skate park is that the whole thing would be shaded, right? Right. And it would be the first shaded skate park in Arizona. So Which it's is crazy. Pretty, <laughs> yeah, it makes sense. Yeah. Um, so how did the idea evolve or come about? Um, so I was working with Vans, which I still am an employee there. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd go down to Stella every morning to get coffee, and I'd tape Cushing Street from uh, the frontage road or from... Um, Barrio Viejo, mm -hmm. and every day I'd hit the light on a red light, and I'd look over there, and I'd say, like, say to myself, like, that needs to be a skate park, just because I've skated many parks underneath freeways and bridges, and, you know, just like in Portland and Seattle and uh, San Francisco. So uh, one day at work, my manager was saying there was a passion project where a Vans employee can submit an idea of what they want. Like if you're an artist, musician, uh, dancer, whatever your passion is, you know. So I was like, well, what if I did this? And he's like, yeah, try it. So that was my idea was to put the Cushing Street skate park idea mm -hmm. for the passion project. And then it just, this is where we're at now, is trying to get it built. So. And you guys have been in talks with the city and just kind of working on fundraising from then and now? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. We, uh, we've had our meetings with the uh, city and the ward that we're in. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, you know, just uh, about a month ago, they got the approval from ADOC because they had a meeting with them. And Yeah, a couple, like a couple weeks ago, we had a meeting with Parks and Rec also for that ward just to, like, discuss the whole building of it and everything. Mm -hmm. yeah. And how much is the total that you need to fundraise to get the park built? So at first... We did an estimate just by like square footage, mm -hmm. and we went down the measure, and then we went online to look like what a similar park they cost, you know, around the U.S. of that same uh, square footage. Mm -hmm. So at first we asked, we put down two hundred thousand dollars, and then you know talking to people and uh, just finding out that it's a lot of money, two hundred thousand dollars. So right now we're at. We're looking to get 90 grand for the whole park. Okay. I think we, it could be done for 90 grand. But we also know the guys who are going to be building the park too, and we can also help out with the building. So cool. that'll also bring Save down costs. Cost yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, what has been like the fundraising process so far? I know you've had a couple of events. Do you have so, more of those planned? Yeah. So the, all the local events that we've been doing have been. Um, we did a, a dance party at Monsoon a couple of months ago, which was just you know really fun friends and the downtown community and right. people supporting the event and we raised about 500 bucks 600 cool. bucks 
for the night, like a four-hour event. And then just the last one we had was at Hotel Congress, mm -hmm. where we had bands play. And we just had the uh, donation uh, bucket or jar at yeah. the door. And we raised over $1,100 mm -hmm. in just like a three-hour show for one night. And I think coming up, we want to do a show at Shea's Lounge. Cool. But other than that, um, just when people are ready to call us or if we have an idea for like a skate contest or mm -hmm. something like that. And you guys have a GoFundMe set up, right? Yeah. Where can people find that if they want to uh, donate? The Cushing Street Skate Park on Facebook.com. The Facebook page? Yeah. Cool. Um, is there anything else you wanted to add about um, it? Hopefully, I mean, we can get it done by the summer. Yeah. I think by March if we can get a nonprofit to sponsor mm -hmm. us mm -hmm. so we can get larger amount of money. Mm -hmm. Hopefully this summer there could be a park, maybe by August, September. We we'll keep our fingers crossed. Yeah. Final question. Is a hot dog a sandwich? It's a hot dog a sandwich. <laughs> um, mm, maybe an open face sandwich. Okay. <laughs> My answer is no, but oh, okay. yeah, I don't think it is. Um, maybe, maybe. Maybe, okay. <laughs> Non-committal on his answer. <laughs> This is Anius Quintella for 5 on 20 News, and we'll see you here tomorrow. Stay filthy, Tucson.